very much for coming to the messy middle part of navigating uncertainty and complexity. My name is Donna Jones. I grew up in the countryside, basically, and I'm always grateful to come to Sweden because the connection between Swedish people and nature is probably the most I've seen in any country I've been in, and I've traveled around the world a couple of times, so that says quite a bit. Uh, but anyway, I spent a lot of time, and when the world didn't make sense to me as a kid, I would go into the bush and just sit there. And I didn't know it then, but what I was doing was taking in, uh, absorbing, if you will, an understanding of interdependencies and, and just the living system, how living systems work. At, that part got confirmed years later when I picked up a book called Nature Deficit Disorder, which spoke to how kids are being cognitively... Uh, compromised by not spending time in nature, by not having a lot of their developmental years spent in nature. So flash forward to my professional career as a facilitator, facilitating in just about every context, every sector, uh, most often transformation of team performance, or organizational change, or leadership development, you know, a long list. And I started seeing some similar, some very interesting arcs, if you will, I call them arcs of transformation, uh, that, that just sort of were the places where good intentions would be well set in front, and then all of a sudden there'd be this messy, confusing bit where people would want to run back to where they were before for safety. Uh, accidentally, or by design, I'd like to say it's more by design, but really it was accident, I also started mentoring people. Uh, and I wouldn't call it of that, to be honest, but it's the best word I have. I would trip over someone who was heavy-duty addiction into drugs, and they needed someone to listen to them, and I, so I would listen to that story. I learned a lot about that world and some things I didn't ever want to know about, but it was, uh, it was an interesting experience. I also ended up attracting, or and they found me or I found them, a lot of kids who had been disenfranchised, uh, dysfunctional, super dysfunctional situations, and in the hours, and I mean hours, weeks, of listening, just listening, that's all I did, nothing more. I would watch them move from suicide to hope. And they did it, uh, but in that, that's the messy part. That's the part that, you know, now if we take it to agile transformation and we take a look at it there, uh, that's what makes reading the deep dynamics very easy to do because uh, because of the uh, capacity to read, not what's on the surface, not to just judge the first take, but to see beneath that and look underneath. Do I just point this here? I'm challenged with these things. Yeah, push. Oh, maybe it's that one. Yes. Here we are at Na uh, tr Agile Transformation, uh, where you're, you've got two worldviews that collide quite <laughs> dramatically. And, uh, and so I, what I'm going to attempt to explain is why you have agile, anti-agile patterns, uh, backlash, if you will, uh, why you have uh, conversations that have agile language on top, but command and control behavior sitting underneath, or right on the surface, actually, most often. And, and, and it's quite simply because there's a lot of embedded assumptions and beliefs that, that sit inside each of these worlds. And a lot of values that are interesting, some of them not positive values. Uh, one of them is on the, on the, um, non, on the traditional side of management. It, it's, it, one of the values is harmony. And what that amounts to is pretend, pretend perfection. So let's make it look like everything's fine, even though it's not. There's so much of a high value around stability in traditional environments that when Agile trots in as a disruptor, it messes up that nice neatness that goes with everything has its order, we can predict the outcomes, we actually engineer them, so that makes it extra easy. Uh, then along comes Agile and it challenges all of those. I just did a workshop on navigating the messy middle in Belgium in the spring and we had a project manager who openly confessed to saying, look, here's how we implemented Agile. We, we did business as you, BAU, business as usual, but we filled out the forms at the end of the week and sent them in. Nobody checked. <laughs> it worked. And so that's, that's one version of fake agile. I also just moderated at the World Agility Forum in Portugal. And there I learned there's another term, uh, I think Toyota mentioned it, called dark agile, which is 
I mean, imagine that we're close to Halloween. I'm pretty sure you can come up with some images that would fit with that. So, it, you know, it's like the dark side of Agile, perhaps the Darth Vader side. So, so there's, that's the, the underpinning then is there's these collisions then between um, the, the certainty, the predictability, the familiarity, the design for stability, and, and the creative, the zone that says, let's try this. We've got 90 day, you know, 90 day delivery times, but let's try this out and see how it works. So there's a lot of interplay in there, and in the zone in between is exactly where the uh, opportunity for leadership comes, and I'll expand on that as we go. So my job over the years has been to detect the underlying dynamics. Uh, this came up, it comes up for me in multiple ways. It comes up for any professional facilitator. We've, we've all seen it at some point or another. But it's the undertow. It's the part where you want to, you know, big ambitions. Like I was organ facilitating a, a group. They had these wonderful ideas about moving forward. And literally, you know, they, they moved forward and then rolled back, meaning they got incremental results. And that was 2003, the epiphany struck me. It struck me that, oh my gosh, if the best we can do is incremental, we're in big trouble. Because it was easy to see from that point of view where we would be today with respect to climate change and other large global issues. We had to evolve. And as long as we were getting incremental results in major transformation initiatives, we weren't gonna get there. So that was, that was the easy part. The harder part was, in, you know, how do you actually map this out? How do you, you know, how do you support people in shift making these shifts? The undertow is made of, I'm gonna just give you three things. It's made of a lot of things, but the three things that you'll easily witness, um, it, it, because it's very subtle stuff. So some of the gross things, that, like the big obvious things are metrics. Metrics that reward individual behavior. You heard that this morning from the conversations. You know, metrics that reward individual behavior, but ask for collaboration. Uh, beliefs that say competition is the way to go uh, to get results. That's how we win in business. But we're going to collaborate and do something creatively. It's like, yeah, that's not how you win. So, so it's those kinds of pulls that, that work at the metrics level. Um, and there's tons of other. The, the big one that everybody's been railing against is, you know, shareholder value tied to CEO compensation. And the worst ethical breaches have been built around that relationship. Obviously, so that's one's fairly straightforward. When you look at a system, you see how it works. Uh, you got, you know, the metrics one is the easy one to remove barriers, and that's a wonderful role for for managers who who are looking to be a part of this new shaping this new world we're in in terms of work and and humanity's future on the planet and so forth. The other one is is uh, conflict um, in traditional organizations. There's been this long thing, and I've I've been a part of it because I you know been delivering training and stuff for eons. And so um, in conflict, most of the traditional organizations center around resolve it. Let's get rid of it. And so the idea is, con you know, if you avoid it, it'll go away. <laughs> That's actually not how it works. If you avoid it, it gets worse, a lot worse. And I'm sure you've seen this. And so the shift that we're looking at, you know, in that, in that uh, jump is to really use conflict to connect, to develop, uh, you know, understand empathically what's going on here. Because the surface is just the surface. Underneath that are hearts and souls wanting to contribute. Uh, I have a tech project on depression and anxiety and building empathy through that and also on building and restoring the capacity to work with the craziness of the world to really restore how you how you do that, and and it all it all centers on on understanding that we are very complex beings, uh, at just in the same way you're working in a complex organization with a lot of interdependencies, we are complex, and so when you use conflict not to get rid of it and pretend that it's everything's good, but to actually walk into it and say what's going on here, what can we learn from this, what can we all learn from it together. That's where diversity starts paying off to organizations. So I'm giving you some of the things that show up out of the undertow that aren't being used for a large, to a large extent to develop agile leadership, to develop capacity to work with all of the things we're working with in today's world. 
And finally, focus. Uh, focus is one, one of those things that when you wake up in the morning, you're focused on getting up and trying to remember where you, what you're doing for the day. Uh, focus is subtle. It's when you want to move forward in action, you, you use mental focus a lot. Organizations, to a large extent, run off of mental focus. But when you want to find out what's going on, you suspend focus and you just listen with the widest radar or, you know, like big thing. <laughs> it's, it's like a big, just look at yourself as a receiver on the top, you know, that you have in television and all that. You're just taking in information. Your mind will sort it out later. It's a sense-making device. It's very good at that. But your information and your data is coming in widescreen. So you're getting social data, you're getting emotional data, you're getting all of the stuff that informs a solid decision going forward. And most people know me for the decision-making stuff, but it's also grounded in, in the deep dynamics. Uh, let's see, push this again. All right, so I'm really grateful to Dave Snowden because some years ago I came here talking about energetic sensitivity, which is the science of intuition. And uh, not everybody relates to that. So Dave kindly used the word sensing, which you'll see is contextually you know, crosses every context in, in the kind of, an, and hopefully I said that right, kind of an model. I'm sure, most people are familiar with what Dave's done. But the beauty of the sense, 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 sense in each of those four areas is that it gives you an, a, a, a way, and this is something robots and AI can't do. This is yours alone. Uh, you sense into these environments and then you can understand what you're working with. To be able to identify, am I in a complicated environment or is this complex? Is it, is it a kind of environment where things are very tangled up but not in a cause, causal way, but more in a very interrelationship kind of way? So causal meaning if, I, if, if, I, um, if this, then that. That's the kind of thinking. If I do this, this will happen, more predictable. But in, in complex environments, there's nothing terribly predictable about them, and that's precisely the environment that you're in in organizations for the most part, and also we're in in the world today. Uh, I really appreciated Dave Packard, uh, founder of Hewlett Packard, a friend of mine, worked for him, and, and she told me the story that, that uh, some of you, they ran across him in the hallway, and when he was asked the question you see on the screen, how can you tell when the HP way is working, he said, well, I can't, but I can sense when it isn't. And I, so that sort of gives you the executive level of how these skills play out. Now, um, I'm sure you've all seen, you know, look, Agile's working, cut it, quickly. <laughs> and you look at the decision, you go, how did they get there? Well, this is data that comes from, and, you, and if you were here in 2016 when I was last here, uh, Jonathan Reams presented this data, but in a different way. And I dug deep, you know, I, sh I asked him for his back end, and he, he shared uh, Teo's Dawson, and tons of great articles on, on uh, Medium by her, by the way, uh, her data. And so, because I'm from Canada, what we're used to seeing in Canada is US data. So I called her up and said, you know, is this American? What am I looking at here? and can I use it? And she said, no, no, this is global. So what they've got in the, in the electrical scale is a way of measuring your capacity, individual capacity to work with complex concepts, to work with complex system, to work with complexity, period. And what they've discovered is that, as you can see from this lovely graph, um, is that there's a gap between, as the more senior you get, the bigger the gap. Now, in that gap, are the anti, sit the anti-agile patterns, sit the confusion around what is agile selling and telling to management. It's all of that package of how do we get this move forward in the, in the management mindset. But also sitting in that gap is the opportunity for greater leadership skills and development that everyone shares, everyone. Not, no one gets left out of, out of that part of it. It takes us back to a time, this was, um, four, you know, like, oh, gosh, I can't remember how many years ago, numbers are, and me are challenging, but there was a time when navigators from Polynesia had absolutely no instruments. They would get in their boats and ship, you know, their boats, and they would travel 4,000 kilometers across the South Pacific using no uh, tools whatsoever, using themselves. 
They would use birds. They would use the ocean swells, top multiple layers of current all the way down. So the undertow picture that I showed you earlier is a picture of an actual undertow wave under the water, uh, the one that sucks you out into the ocean if you get into it uh, and don't know how to swim out of it. Uh, but that's what they use. They use the stars. So what they're doing is, is the same thing. What, what they did then is the same thing we're doing now. We're drawing on very ancient skills to take multiple streams of data and pull it in and make sense out of it. Now that's both a cognitive function here, but it's also very much so draws on a whole lot more of your intelligence than, than anything intellectual could ever do. So uh, <laughs> both men and women were trained for this. They started very young. Uh, they would be at the age of one or two from the time they're, you know, they would be left in tidal pools to get used to the currents, start to feel what those waves felt like and so forth. And then they would uh, develop them, you know, like a very rigorous training. And, and so the sentence with the blank in it is for the men, because both men and women were trained. But the gentleman in the photograph who's still here, you know, he's, he's the one that's alive, you know, now, still practicing these skills. At 14, he tied his, okay, so imagine, men, the most sensitive part of your body, the part that when you get kicked, bad things happen. Um, imagine taking that body part and tying it to the mast, to the top of the thing, so you could sense the currents impacting the boat. That, yes, that's a little bit of an outrage for women. So it's, it's one of those things that, but that's the level of commitment uh, that they had to being able to detect the multiple currents, the layers of currents that, that are part of navigating uh, the uncertainty part navigating the waters. So that's the skill set we're using. Everybody has it, uh, some to a more or lesser degree. Usually the people with the most sensitivities are on chronic disease, uh, chronic sick, chronically ill, uh, because they can't function in those environments at all. So, or, the, or they uh, have gotten into, de fallen into depression, deep depression, because the world makes so little sense and it's extremely noisy. I was just in a Stephen Kotler workshop um, doing flow for writers. Flow is the challenge. It's the gap between the challenge and the skill. So we've got that graph shows we've got a gap in the skills. The challenge is big worldwide in organizations, quite often personally. But the, the gap is where we close that. And it's a peak performance state, which meant, means that when you know how to create that, when you use these challenges to go into flow states and peak performance states, you actually reduce cognitive overload. So a whole lot of bad decisions get made because people are just overloaded cognitively. They just they chip out. Front, prefrontal cortex goes offline, and, and really dumb decisions come out of it. The good news is, scientifically, you don't have to stretch far, 4%. Base jumpers and people that fly off tops of buildings, they're, they're, they're doing it more dramatically. <laughs> you don't have to do that. 4% uh, is fine, but the, the bottom line is you always make the call. You decide how far you go. The core skill set, uh, there's a lot of core skills that go with it, but the most obvious one is to shift perspectives. This is a fly's eye, and a fly has, each one of the little dots on there is a, its own camera. It's sensitive to light and darkness. It can move all around. And so using that, the fly knows what's coming out at any point in time. If you try to hit a fly, it's not challenge. It's not easy. They're very quick, and they can know you're coming. So, uh, but a fly's eye, when you put that all together, you get the bigger picture. And that's the, the way you make decisions in, in complexity. It's also the way you build bridges. Diverse points of view are part of that. So can we? Let's see if I can, how do I do this? So the other part of what goes on in complexity and, and agile thing is, is emergence. Do you know how to turn this on? So I'll give you a feeling of what emergence looks like in the most dramatic way possible. Yeah, he paddled right into the middle of a humpback feeding moment. And you could see from, sorry, now we need to take it off. <laughs>
Just wanted to give you that feeling. But the emergencies usually not look like that. It's not usually gross motors like, poof, you know, these humpback whales blow up in front of your uh, uh, kayak. It's more subtle than that. So you're really looking for nuances and reading the nuances. Whoops. Uh, I want to back up several steps more because what's going on and the, the way in which I made sense of the wider things of what's going on in the world today is that we are in the middle of what, what the systems theory, theorists called bifurcation. And it is a place where, where um, there is a split. It works, it's, it's a law of transformation in, in nonlinear systems. And so we've been moving, we've been designing our organizations on linear, we've been running everything on linear, decisions are based on linear, which is why we're dealing with climate change and a whole lot of other issues that, that have been created that way, uh, or at least amplified that way. And, and so it's a, it, it, it marks a radical change in the evolutionary trajectory where we either, the whole thing just collapses or we transform it. So we, each one of us plus everybody, in, we stand in that gap. We stand in the moment where you can create the future you want, where you create a new world, you know, the whole thing out of it. But it's, it's through that gap in complexity that we, we, uh, we do that. Thank you. <laughs>